Uh, good afternoon there. Um, hope everybody can hear me. Um, thanks for joining. Um, just a, a quick update and overview from today's session. Um, obviously, this is the first of the Bimstall webinar series uh, concentrating on loadable families. Um, so I've got a few slides and I'll be jotting in and out of those slides and in and out of the Autodesk Revit platform. Um, when it comes towards the end, we'll put up some um, infinite information if you want to grab a hold of us um, and get in contact. So... Here we go. Um, so a little bit about myself. Um, I'm Chris Atkinson. Um, I'm technical director of BIM Store, which is part of Space Group. Um, as you can see, a couple of the companies there that fall underneath the Space Group umbrella. Um, I've been an architectural technician with Space Group for the last 10 years. Um, and in the last five, kind of moving heavily into the BIM Store section um, of the company um, and kind of driving forward from there. So the purpose of today's webinar session uh, was really to an opportunity to share some of the, the techniques and processes that we uh, use on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, the sessions are based around the Autodesk Revit platform. Um, I'm well aware this is not the only BIM software platform, um, but it definitely is one of the most popular. Um, for those attending, you know, um, there will be various levels of experience with regards to work Revit. So you may already know a lot of this stuff, um, but we'll hope that so you can take something away with you um, that will help you in your day to day. Um, so BIM Store, we kind of see um, content creation itself as, as almost an art form. You know, all the projects that are architects and technicians are working on is made up of a collection of components and families whether those be system or loadable so if you can master those um, you know you can get the benefits from your building information model extract the data accordingly and then save time and effort um, so we just want to share some of those with you um, in the future we have a, a number of upcoming webinar sessions um, obviously the first is loadable families which i'll be talking through today um, but we also have uh, webinars set up for august and september to get into system families um, so those are walls floors and roofs kind of the basic ones in the first uh, session and then mep pipework systems in another So in Revit itself, there essentially falls into two core family types. Um, adaptive components is, a, is an additional one on there, but mainly you've got system families, which involve assemblies of products such as floors, walls, uh, and systems, uh, for example. Um, and the second one is loadable families. So what is a loadable family? Essentially, a loadable family is something that is created in the family editor environment in Revit and often gives you a .rfa file. Um, when creating a loadable family, you generally choose from a list of default templates. Um, there's too many kind of product variations to be able to cover what loadable families can do, but it's, it's just understanding what is working for you and what family type you are creating before you start. Family planning. So one of the things that we obviously get tasked with on a day to day when creating content is, is having an understanding of what we actually want to do before we start getting into it and creating it. And it's often very useful just to kind of have a think about what it is you are actually creating, what information you want to extract from that component and how it will be used within a project. You know, what options and features does the user have, for example? So, you know, asking yourself some of the questions that are on the screen there and kind of thinking ahead in terms of what you're doing um, will be a real benefit when you're coming to actually creating the piece of content. Uh, the BIMSO Bible, which is currently available, and I'll go on to that in just a second. Um, in the back of that, we do have a couple of helpful uh, pages which refer to content creation checklist. And these are just there to kind of, you know, as a, as a planner for going ahead when you are creating that content. 
our own standards document, the Bimstow Bible, um, you can actually download free from the Bimstow website if you head to the resource section. Um, and we advise anybody that is creating content that this is a, a, a you know a free to use standard um, which offers uh, topics covering level of detail, the nesting of families, naming, etc. So you know if you get an opportunity to have a look at that or you're creating content, please take a look. Um, if you are looking to host content at all on Bimstore, you know it will have to meet these requirements before it can be hosted on our website. So, one um, some of the examples that I'll be looking at actually in the Revit platform today will be using and based around this example component. So this is a out of the box Autodesk Revit family uh, for a conference table with some chairs around it. So you know if you went to insert a, a new family um, in Revit, you know you will be populated with the out of the box uh, library, and if you scroll down furniture, you'll be able to find this particular component. So I'm going to kind of jot in and out of um, the software and the, the presentation slides here. So the first one I wanted to cover was tick boxes. Now, these are very straightforward to kind of incorporate. But the way we create content at BIM Store is to try and make it as easy to use as possible. Um, you know, so any component that you tend to download from BIM Store, what we see is if you select that in a Revit project, um, if you look to the properties toolbar on the left hand side, um, quite high up under the construction heading, you'll see if there's any features or options available in there. So the example that we've got on the screen there is of um, a Lloyd Worrell door set. Um, and again, you can see a number of different features in there that go to drive the specification of that door, assisting it. So, you know, you can turn the iron mung resets on for the the type of door and the area that it is located within a school um, so i'm going to jump straight into the revit platform here um, and if i just open that up you can see an example project here i've got a couple of our bimians that were previously modeled um, and again those have tick boxes and things on there that can do that as well as a couple of examples in here. So this is the, the project that I'm going to use for, for demonstrating during the webinar. This here is our Revit family, um, our out-the-box one that we are using. Again, I simply loaded up by going to Insert, Load Family, and here is the, the library, down to Furniture and Tables, and you could see that it is in this folder somewhere, just finding the right one. There we go, the conference table. So that's all I've done. I've just loaded that in. It's exactly out the box as it should be. You can kind of see the properties on the left-hand side. There's there's no information filled in. If I look at edit type, you can see it, it's very basic. Um, so what we want to do is we want to add a simple tick box to this. So how am I going to do that? Well, first of all, I need to get it out of the project environment and back into that family editor. So if I select the table itself and hit the edit family button at the top of the screen, you'll see the modeling environment that that's in. And I can kind of start to select the various elements. You can see the pull handles on those where we've created extrusions. So what I'm going to do with this is I'm actually going to include a tick box for it has the chairs or it doesn't have the chairs. So nice and easy to do. Um, all I can do is I can select all the chairs. Again, various ways to do it. You can hold shift, etc. You can right click and you can select all instances and it'll allow you to do that. I'm just going to go through each one, one at a time. And you can see the ones on the either side of the table, the long length, have been set up with a parametric array so that if you increase the table length, it'll actually insert additional chairs in there. Um, so I might have to do one at a time because they're grouped, um, the, um, the chairs. So you can kind of see I've got those two end chairs selected. And you see on the properties on the left hand side there is a visible button there and a tick box this little button here allows you to associate parameters through so if i click this button it's asking me which parameter do i want to associate this with so i'm going to create a parameter at this time by clicking the add parameter button um, one thing to note when you are creating parameters in revit is the choice between a family parameter and a shared parameter um, again it does exactly what it says there in brackets. A family parameter cannot appear in schedules or tags, um, and a shared parameter can. 
So the parameters that you're assigning these to, you want to kind of establish how important they are. Will you want to extract that information and schedule it later down the line? Otherwise, you might have to go back in and edit your family. So for this, we're going to say the chairs are quite an important part. You know, we're going to do a, a bill of quantities for the project um, and we want to know uh, how many chairs we're going to need. Uh, so I'm going to turn that to shared and click select. You can kind of see there it's asking for a shared parameter file. So do you want to choose one? You can actually create your own very easily or you can browse to a location of an existing one. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do exactly that and browse to the location of an existing one because the BIM store um, resource area also has that shared parameter file which is publicly available to download and use. So if I scroll through and bear with me, I'm just getting my bearings. So it is, um, bear with me, BIM store presentations is what I'm looking at, loadable families. There we go. That is the file that I've downloaded direct from, from the website. You can group these, you can rename them and you can add new parameters. So you can kind of see there we've got some of the industry required uh, parameters included in that including our BIM store standard ones, Coolby, IFC parameters, etc. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to create a new group in here and I'm going to call this um, data. And I'm going to create a couple of parameters in here to group that. So just by creating a new parameter, I can call this has chairs. You can see what I'm doing is I'm using the camel case there rather than putting spaces in just to fit with the BIM store Bible. And that tends to be the way that we work and that we're used to. If you drop down the type of parameter, you can actually see there um, the various various types you have. And one of those is a, that simple yes, no. So I'm going to click yes, no and click OK. And you can see that there. What I'm also going to do, uh, just to be a little bit cleverer, is I'm going to add um, a, a little bit of formula in this. So I'm going to put um, no chairs in there as well. Probably a bit over the top, but just for the example you know it'll show how you can link the two parameters together via via formula so again yes no so i've got those two parameters there now i'm actually going to add those to that project once that's all filled out you can choose the heading that you want to group it under it's always important about structuring your parameters and making sure it's not just a huge long list and we'll cover that a little bit further down the line um so what i'm going to do for this is i'm going to just pick construction um the other important section or the last part before you click ok is whether it is a type or an instance parameter the way we kind of work this and, and generally explain it is that um if the user is to have that option is to adjust that specification we make it an instance parameter we give them the ability to quickly decide whether they want that or don't it means that they don't have to edit the family type um, and they can do that from the properties dialog box on the left hand side of the screen so if i click instance and then okay okay those are now aligned what i'm going to do is i'm also going to edit these groups and i'm going to assign that as well so it has chairs and finish and the same on the other side edit the group has chairs and finish if i click our types up the top here you can actually see that that parameter has been added in there and there's the calculations and the formula to drive the number of chairs down either side of it so what i'm going to do is i'm going to quickly add um that other parameter in there so i'm going to click new parameter go back to my shared parameter file and select no chairs Put it under the wrong head in there so again trying to organize these and keep them structured is is a great way of kind of splitting the data up and making it readable you know so it's not just a huge long list of parameters there's nothing more frustrating than trying to wade through all that information so i'm just going to uh, modify and put that under construction again and again that's going to be an instance so just a very simple formula in here, I and mean, we'll, we'll touch on some guidance for formula a little bit further on. Um, you can put the formula in here to drive that. So the simple one is, if we put not has chairs and close brackets, you can see that's grayed out now. So if I decide to take that, it's either one 
or the other. That's a very simple formula there, but they can get quite advanced. Um, they've got to be written in a particular fashion. The parameter names have to tie through. So again, I would recommend not putting any, um, you know, formula symbols, plus, minus, subtract, multiply in your parameter names be or brackets, because, you know, if you try to use formula with it, it simply won't work. It'll recognize it as a over complex and incorrect uh, formula. So I'm going to click OK on that and click apply. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to load that back into our project and override the parameters. So now you'll see when I have my basic table, I can select it. And on the left hand side, those additional parameters have appeared in the properties toolbar. So currently it has the chairs. If I decide to untick and click apply, the chairs simply disappear. Nice, easy, fairly basic. Nothing that isn't standard out of the box for, for Revit. So if we go from current slide and we move on to the next one, this is drop downs. <clears throat> so again, you know, for particular products, there might be a number of different options. Um, the example that we've got um, on the screen there is for a grid switch, uh, which our manufacturer, Detail Electrical, um, actually provide. So essentially, this is, you know, a switch element that can have up to eight switches in it. And each one of those can be a different electrical module that goes in it. Um, so you can kind of see the switch type one to eight and then the, the, the various modules in there. So this one you can see is actually for a one gang, which is a single switch. Um, and it can, you know, you can choose from the drop downs here. So we're going to do a quick example of that and, and show how that works. Um, so if I say head straight back to uh, Revit, what we're going to do is the same thing with the chairs. We let it our family. But with this one, what I want the drop down to do is I want the drop down to actually choose what type of chair we have. So the important thing with regards to this is the category that these chairs are modeled in. So if I look at this chair and edit where this is modeled, if I hover this button here, you can actually see that that is modeled as a furniture category element. So that's quite important for the use of these, these drop downs. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go to insert and I'm going to load an alternative chair type in that we can use. So I can go to furniture. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Uh, actually, where we're going, furniture, should be furniture, uh, seating. And these are the various types in there. So that one looks quite good. We'll be able to tell the difference between that. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to load that one in. What I'll do is I'll place one over the side just so we can see the difference. Now, both these chairs have exactly the same category. And that means because they have the same category, we can choose them from the drop down. So I'm going to actually highlight this chair. And as you can see, at the top here, we have a label on it, and there is no parameter assigned to that. So from the drop down, I can add a parameter. And again, I could call this, for example, chair type. We want to make it an instance because we want the user to be able to choose that chair type. But the main thing we're looking at here is the type of parameter. It's already grayed out. Um, and you can see it's actually looking for anything in the furniture category. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put that under construction again and click OK. And I'm going to do the same for these other elements. Once I've created that parameter, you can kind of see it's in the drop down. So it's nice and easy to assign. So if I edit the group and assign those to that. And again, on the opposite side of the table, select that and choose that parameter. Click OK. So I can delete this one out. What I'm going to do is I'm going to load that straight back into that project and override the parameter values. So now when I select this table, what you can see on the left hand side on the properties, trying to keep them all together so that all the options and all the, um, you know, all the specification choices that you use, I may have are all in one location. You can actually see I have a drop down here. 
so you can kind of see there are different chairs and different furniture elements in there so this is reading anything that was in that family that was under that furniture category so for example this one here currently has arms on it so if i change the drop down and change it to a task chair and click apply you'll see there all those have changed if i go down to the next one and click apply you can see all those chairs have changed to that new type so again it's depending on how many variations you have you know there is a limit that we would kind of recommend going to you know you this may be a complex product um it may have multiple choices but you know by including every single choice and every single variation you might be over complicating it a bit too much so it's important not to kind of run too far with it and try and replicate a product 100 percent in terms of everything and all the additional options and accessories that it can do so from current slide again <clears throat> the next one is error messages this is always a good way to um, you know provide a user um, some guidance if they are misspecifying a product particularly you know if you're giving them the option to adjust it you know you might want to build some additional parameters in there just to kind of back up that you know look what you've done it's not quite right so we're going to do that and i'll show you an example that we already have so as you can see with this door type here this is that lloyd Worrell door uh, di downloaded directly from bim store um, and as you can see there are a number of different sizes in terms of door um, which we've kind of pre-configured um, so you can kind of see those changing as we go through the width and the height based off Revit being parametric um, what I did do is I duplicated one of those types uh, so if I can do that again with this one edit the type duplicate it and you know this might be a, a designer creating his own size and we'll say right well the width is actually going to be 2800 if we change the width there to 2800 and click OK, it'll think about it, it'll stretch it, and then as you can see, what's happened there is that door has stretched parametrically. It has worked, you know, the software has allowed it to stretch that, but we want to give it some guidance in that, you know, your, single, your door leaf is, is too large there. Um, and as you can see, we have kind of a, a pre modeled exclamation point to try and highlight that. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take that exclamation point and add it to the table component that we've been looking at. So if I edit the family again, um, I'll do my little bit of here's one I prepared earlier because I already have that exclamation point. Um, again, it's just a very simple uh, family, you know, a, a revolve almost with a material assigned to it. Um, so I'm going to load that into the chairs. And then you can see I can position that there. So, you know, first idea and first thing to do is kind of position it correctly. So I'm going to lock it to the very center of that table. And if I go onto my front elevation also, you can kind of see it'll, it'll stand above the table. So we can see it there. I'll just go on to shaded view so we can see that. Again, as with the chairs and the tick boxes um, that we looked at a little bit earlier, you can select that particular hosted element you can click to associate and what i'm going to do is i'm going to create a parameter in here called error and make that an instance parameter again for the benefit of this i'm putting all the kind of all the parameters that we're working with under that construction heading just to keep them nice and grouped and organized so if i click ok there we go so that is there so now we need to link that error to something so we can see the various parameters in here for the height, the length and the width of the table. Um, we want to put in some additional information about possibly the maximum length or the maximum width of that table. So I need to add a couple of additional parameters in here. So if I click uh, new parameter and put in max length and click OK, my maximum length of this table will put in it, say, five meters. Again, you can put uh, figures and uh, information in the formula, and what it does is it'll grey that out and lock it down to a certain extent. But if you edit the family type and take that formula out, you know, it is fully adjustable. 
So our max length is going to be five meters. Um, what I'm going to do here also is I'm going to create a text parameter and I'm going to put in, um, I'm going to call this guidance. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to essentially link that icon to pop up if the length is exceeded. And I'm also going to give the user some guidance on letting them know why it has actually popped up. Um, so again, constraints and construction. There we go, instance. And you can kind of see the two there. So there's your error and there's your guidance. So that's just a text parameter. I can put anything I need in there at the moment. Um, this is where your formula comes back into play. So it's driving this error and driving this guidance parameter by something so um the formula again fairly straightforward for this example if um length is above max length then that is the error appearance so you can kind of see on there if i put in length and test this at 5050 click apply you can see that's ticked automatically and if i go anything under that five meters you know for 800 for example click apply you can see that on ticks so that will kind of populate that uh, that error icon if you like for the geometry and make that visible um the second part is we want to do some guidance so what i've got here is a little bit of a formula that i kind of prepared earlier again you can kind of see that and i'll explain this as we go through so it's fairly straightforward and, and as i said i have got some, some advice and guidance on formula just coming up on on the next example so what this is saying that is if there is an error then what it's going to what the parameter is going to say it is going to say please check size information as the current selection is not available otherwise selection size is available and again you can these can become really complicated and i'll show you an example of a, a formula that i worked up fairly recently um you know they can get very in depth but they can be quite powerful as well so all i'm going to do is i'm going to copy that i tend to like to use notepad to write um you write my formula in it means that you know if i'm doing multiple lines and you know multiple versions to cover lots of variations i can kind of you know put a space in between them and keep them nice and organized so i'm going to copy that and i'm going to put that in guidance and click enter so you can kind of see that's reading through now so it now says size selection available again recommend that you test and you flex all the parameters and things that you're doing when you're creating content um, just because if you go too far down the line and something breaks you've got to try and figure out what it was test and flex regularly as you're going through so 5050 you can see both of those parameters actually change um, so let me just change this back to 3500 click apply what we'll do is we'll change that length and we'll modify it to be an instance parameter and whoop uh, number of chairs one side is driven by it. the error message that i'm getting there is seeing that there's a parameter link to it which isn't an instance so it's not allowing you to do that so number of chairs uh, one side so that's this one here so again a couple of these i might have to adjust number of chairs so there's a there's three parameters they're all linked and as I start to adjust these, you'll see it's starting to let us do that now because the linked ones are actually changed. So I'll click apply. And what we'll do is we'll load this back into that project and override. So if I just, um, let's have a look. If I just choose this one, for example, what you can see on there is our table again we've still got those options and those features for the chairs whether it has chairs or no chairs and it's telling us that there's not an error and there's a selection available if i look at that in plan because we made the length and instance parameter you can see i now have pull handles on it again you can kind of adjust the length here and click apply and it will update it in that fashion but you know if you're on the right view you'll actually see the nice pull handles to be able to put it left and right so all i'm going to do is i'm going to drag that to the left and what you'll see magically is that it's hidden off because i was using my crop view and you can see that that table is currently at 47 
So let's just use the opposite way around and take it over to five. Let's go to another view first. Actually, we'll be able to um, be able to see it a little bit better. So there's your long table, and you can kind of see it using the parametric array down either end. But we'll make this five five hundred, for example, and click apply. And there you go. You can see that error icon popping up. And now if it's selected, you know, the guidance is there to tell you that you need to check your size information because that size might not be available. Again, if these are all shared parameters, these can all be scheduled. So as you're working through a project, you know, you've got a schedule there, which is giving you all your furniture elements and you put in an error message in all those pieces of content. You know, it will tell you which ones have errors with them. Allows you to rectify the problem a lot quicker. So that was error messages. So this one here is half an example of one formula. Um, again, it looks a little bit complex and it looks, you know, because there is a lot of it. There's actually a lot more. It's just actually cut off the size of the screen, but it's not as complex as it looks. It's just trying to cater for every single variation. Um, and this was actually for a cable tray element. Um, a, a flat bend if you like um, so basically what it's doing is it's telling you if the tray width is this and the bend radius is this and the angle is this then the weight equal that and it's doing that and it's covering it over and over again um, when you first start with formula they can be a bit daunting and can be quite difficult to understand um, you know it's trying to understand how Revit wants you to write and add those formulas and that's you know number of number of brackets number of uh, you know commas things like that but one thing that has helped us through the years um, is a particular document that was uh, provided during Autodesk University in 2010 and it is the fuzzy math essentials for Revit and family builders um, there is a link on there um, to it. I managed to, to find it, so it still is online. Um, and obviously, I've noted the, the the creators of that document as well, just to give them thanks. Um, you know, it's a document that we use regularly. It will start to get into very complex formula with regards to trigonometry, um, as well as all the standard ones. So it's well worth taking a look at. Um, I'll leave that on the screen. For just a little bit longer in case anybody is looking at jotting or noting that down or wanting to take a screenshot um if you miss it and you want it the email address will be at the end um please drop us an email we'll send that through to you no problem okay uh type catalogs uh, type catalogs are, you know, are, are fairly useful, um, and the reason that they are, you know, apparent in Revit is that, you know, for example, a, a, a Perlin may have, you know, 500 different sizes based off height, width, gauge, etc. Um, but the user may be only concerned about three or four of those sizes. You know, they don't want to load all 500 variations into their project and increase the project file size for types they're not using um, so the bimstool bible essentially recommends that if your component is going to contain more than eight types eight skus that you adopt a, a type catalog um, and that's very straightforward i mean you create the types in revit you export out to a family catalog and it, it, it does it for you but the important thing is it's got to be, you know, it's got to be named exactly the same as your RFA file. The two files are kind of partnered, if you like, um, and it has to be saved in the same location and you have to load it through a, a particular fashion. So what I thought I'd do is I'd highlight how that actually is loaded in and kind of suggest, you know, that, you know, if you are creating content with more than eight types, it's well worth having a look at adopting um, a type catalog. They can actually be edited through Excel, but again, kind of changing through to a, your TXT through to a CSV and then back again. Again, I would recommend regular testing because sometimes you get a couple of error messages up there, which can be a bit of a pain. So I'm just going to go back to Revit there. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to do another. Here's one I prepared earlier. Um, so in my folder to the left hand of my screen, 
um, you can see I've downloaded a particular component for Metsec, which is their C section Perlin. And you can see there is my RFA file, my Revit file, and my .text file, which is the type catalog. Named exactly the same, saved in, saved in exactly the same location. If I open that, you'll see it's just a, a lot of coding. So what the software is trying to do is it's trying to read that as it's opening the family. So what you need to do is you need to go to insert and then load family. Again, that's very different to, you know, your dragging and dropping that some people might do. You have to kind of load it in this way to get the type, um, the type dialog box to pop up. So I'm going to go to um, my desktop, uh, Bimstore presentations, um, loadable families, content, and then I know it's there. You can't actually see that that .txt file is in there because it's only looking for RFA or ADSK files. Um, but what I'll do is if I click that, you'll see you get the types popping up. So this includes all the information that's in that content. Um, the grey ones are obviously the names, the variations. Um, but if you were to scroll across, you can kind of get all that information there. So you can kind of review that before you load those elements in. Um, you can kind of go down the left hand side and if you want to hold control, you can actually select multiple. And then you can click OK. And what it will do is it will think about it for a second because it's pulling that information from um, from that .txt file and it will load those in. So if I went to structure and beam now, what you can see is I have those types all dropped down there. So it's quite a nice way of keeping it organized and allowing people not to stick too many unused variations in their project. <clears throat> One thing that we kind of uh, insist on when we put content onto our site is a user guide. Um, you know, there is no set way for creating content. You know, people may create the same thing in various different ways and may have additional tick boxes, drop downs and features for them. Um, now, if you're new to the software platform, that can often be quite daunting. Um, and, you know, they may not know that these features that you've spent time building in are actually there. Um, so the inclusion of a, a user guide document um, is always recommended. I mean, the anything that you download from BIM Store at the minute will have a PDF user guide included in it. Um, and what it'll do is it'll talk you through it. It'll explain if there is a type catalog, the importance of the two files and that they should be saved in the same location and how you load it up. But it'll also go through the tick boxes. You know, does things have, like this boiler, for example, on the, the right hand side of the screen, does that have a particular clearance zone? And you can also see the little box on the top there can actually be fully adjusted and rotated around 360 degrees um, and changed whether it's top side or bottom for the connection, that kind of thing. So, you know, let the user know the clever stuff that you're doing. So, one thing that is quite apparent in the industry is is the confusion over file size um you know i have seen a number of different documents and recommendations that you know your file size should be you know below 700 kilobytes or something like that and i mean during the time in building content you know i've created families that are in excess of, of eight megabytes um you know that might seem like a lot but you know the amount of configurations and variation in there is absolutely huge um, so whilst we do say, you know, try and keep them to a minimum wherever possible, um, you know, it's making sure that, um, you know, you're not going the opposite way. Uh, we have received content where, you know, people haven't used Revit for its parametric power, where they have simply, you know, created one element and then saved as and then create the next size up as a completely separate file. Um, test for you if you ever want to you know test that out you could actually drop something in and use an array and array it 100 times in a project if you hit save you'll notice the file goes up slightly but if you were to actually load two families in and hit save you'll notice it actually goes up higher for those two families than 100 um, of the same object array so you know if you're 
um, component is one megabyte in size um, and you drop a hundred of them into a project your project size isn't going to go up by a hundred megabytes you know that's a, a false lie so it's trying to make the the best of the content you've got and if that means building a little bit more detail in to the family size that's not a problem some of the guidance notes on there to kind of look at getting your file size smaller obviously model text is quite a large one we try to remove that wherever we can um, you'll notice that alert symbol that we used um, previously that is just a piece of geometry we did used to have a guidance note that popped up and actually told you what the error was but that increased the file size so we looked at kind of adjusting that and removing the model text void cuts void cuts are always a bit of a pain um you know and the least you can the, the the least amount of void cuts is better a suggestion would be if you're creating an extrusion that has a hole cut through it don't do them as two separate elements don't do it as an extrusion and a void simply edit the extrusion and put that hole in the extrusion it'll keep your file size down and again if you're cutting multiple voids out of one particular piece of geometry you know that can that can cause issues purging your components that's always a, a big one so again those include any nested elements try and go through all your families or you know once you've kind of finished it go back through make sure that you're purging anything out if you're using the drop downs that i showed earlier if you're purging make sure in your drop down list that you're not deleting out or purging out the types that aren't actually placed otherwise your drop down list will become significantly smaller um card and jpeg images again you know we ourselves get 3d card and other sat files etc from sources to assist the modeling you know it allows us to essentially trace over the top of it but those should always be removed you know make sure that when you are using it as guidance to help you model that you're removing them before you kind of send that on and the final one was don't explode your card as well because again you're getting lots of additional line types from AutoCAD and it can break it down into a thousand more lines than what it actually appears to be the bottom note there quite is a useful one and i'm still a bit stumped of this how this actually works but if you if you actually create your family and purge it all out and do all of the above and hit save you might consider your file size might be a bit too high if you actually go file save as and i'd say an additional one or a number at the end of the name or slightly tweak the name and hit save again look and see what happens to the file size it often drops down by a couple of megabytes it's actually really strange but it's a really handy tip to to know especially if you're concentrating on keeping those file sizes down to a minimum the metadata obviously will will covered quite heavily the geometry and the, the cool things you can do with generally but you know data is probably more of an important part I, I, I'm one of the opinion that you know geometry and data both have a have a place in in content but you know the data element in terms of, of building information modeling is absolutely vital and a key and it's important to organize and structure that metadata um, the industry is obviously uh, going around and talking about PDTs, product data templates, and Lexicon at the minute. Um, and again, I guess you know it has been slightly delayed, um, but we're all waiting to see what comes happen with that. And we completely agree with PDTs here at BIM Store. If they're available, we will build those into the content we provide. Um, we've got a number of uh, SIBSI approved boilers and product data templates that are alive through some of our manufacturers, so for example, Bosch. Um, I mentioned using those group headings you know there's nothing worse than you know opening a piece of content and having almost 100 parameters under the same heading it's trying to filter and organize that and your eyes become a bit of a blur so using those grouped headings and splitting it up into kind of manageable sections is 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 always advised unfortunately because of the way the software is hardwired and locked down you can't add your own group headings that's a bit of a pain and I'd love to be able to change that, um, but you know we we kind of got to make do with what we've got. Uh, as I said, the Bimsel Bible is there, so if you need any guidance on parameters that should be included in any of the content you're creating, uh, you know, to UK industry requirements and PAS 1192, take a look. It'll give you an explanation about them um, and what we do here at Bimsel. 
So structuring that metadata, um, I wanted to give you a couple of examples of, of how we kind of group it. So we've got a number of various sections that go as an absolute minimum requirement into all our content. So first set of those are, the, are our BIM store parameters that just essentially allow us to track who has created the component, what revision it's at, where it's come from, etc. And we'd like to keep them all under the group heading model properties. Kind of, you know, it's associated with who has modeled that. We keep it to one side. Kobe parameters, probably one of the most important set of parameters. Again, those are all included in that shared parameter file that can be downloaded from the resource section. Um, but what we tend to do is we tend to group those and only those under the heading other. It keeps them nice and organized. And it means that if you ever go to the other heading, you can see all your Kobe parameters in one go. IFC parameters. Fortunately, they have their own heading. There is a one there called IFC parameters, so it kind of speaks for itself. Um, with regards to MBS create specification software, you know, there are a couple of parameters that MBS require that allow the content to plug into that specification. Um, again, we try to keep those under a nice organized kind of grouped section. So we use general for those. Um, NBS and the, the MBS object standard might, might classify it differently, um, but they're the same parameters and we just try and keep them, um, keep them nice and organized. Um, the classification parameter is one on the bottom. Again, that's UniClass 2015, which is the, the, current, the current classification system that we use. Um, and again, we tend to throw those in with the Cobra parameters. There's only, only an additional two of those. Um, anything above that, you know, if you want to add additional parameters into your content, you know, information that you feel is useful to get across to the client or the user, um, you can build those in. Um, you know, you can put your product data template parameters in there, no problem. Um, and there are other group headings or plenty of other group headings to kind of choose from. But one of the kind of most used ones is data, you know, the data with regards to that product. So you can kind of use those as a, as a bit of a guide. Um, the last section um, of the of the webinar was to kind of look at some of the apps and plugins that we use here at Bimstore. Um, as you can imagine, the, you know, all the parameters I've just been through might be about 50, 60 parameters to add to a family. Now, if you've got to do that to multiple families and, you know, multiple types and fill in the data, it can be painstaking. You know, you've got to do one at a time and it's a bit of a pain. So we kind of got to the point where we couldn't do without some of these plugins. Um, obviously, the ID at Bimlink is a great app that allows you to go in, essentially uh, push the parameters out to an Excel file, fill them in an Excel and push it back into um, the into Revit. Um, the one that I'm going to kind of go through and show a very quick example of is the other one, which is the RTV tools. Um, you know, we've got a good working relationship with those guys who are based in New Zealand. Um, and I'm an advocate for, for promoting uh, the tool that they provide. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go back to Revit and show you an example of exactly how it works. So if I just go to File New and create a blank family, again, these are my or FT files, which are my template files, I'm just going to select a generic model. So this is just gives you a center grid and your modeling environment. Um, I'm not going to put any geometry in at the minute. All I'm going to look at is the parameters. So what you can see on the left hand side there is this has the hardwired parameters in there with nothing filled in. There's no Kobe, there's no BIM store, there's nothing like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add them and I want to do that quickly. So RTV Tools has its its own plugin um, on on Revit, and I can click that shared parameter manager to launch it. Just takes a second to to open up there, but then what you're provided with is essentially the the, the kind of the, the application. So you can do um, project parameters or system parameters as well as loadable family parameters. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to actually going to go to import from and I'm going to select my shared parameter file that we had from BIM store before. If I scroll down these you can kind of see these are just various ones for the manufacturers and that the team have been using. But if I go to family and I go to search for BIM store parameters I know that what I'm doing is I'm filtering 
by the group heading and you know as i showed previously in that shared parameter where i was creating those parameters um you could actually um go through um and and give a group heading so if i scroll down here i can kind of see here there's the the um the template ones it must have already been added there so i've kind of added it again so hence the duplication so apologies for that um but what i'm going to do is i'm going to go down these i'm going to select some of them so one of each i'm going to tell it that i want those all to be grouped under model properties and that i want them to be a type parameter i'm going to click ok and i'm going to click add parameter and you can see on the bottom left that's done that in a, in less than a, a second or two quickly and done that so if i go back and go out and click on here you can see all those parameters are already in there i'll show a little bit further of what it can do because obviously as well as adding the parameters you, if they're pre-populated and fixed you know it's going to be the same information um you know for several uh, parameters you can actually get it to fill those in for you as well as you're inputting it so what i'm going to do here is kobe i'm going to scroll down again again that same issue where i've added that shared parameter file twice so you can remove the shared parameter files um what i'm going to do is i'm going to um i'm going to select this one and i'm going to click on it you can kind of see there the default value you can actually put formula in as well so i'm going to say that this is uni class 2015 and click ok for barcode for example i'm going to make this an instance and i'm going to you know i'm going to please uh, record on commissioning so i'm going to highlight those two and i'm going to add parameter if i go back out and actually look at that you can kind of see that there already filled in so it's a good opportunity and a good way to get those parameters and that information completed very quickly rather than doing it as a manual process um obviously the example of it that i've been showing um just shows um you know one one family and doing that to it but what you'll notice along the top is you also have um buttons here that allow you to actually add those parameters to multiple files so you know if you have a folder of all the families that you need to add these parameters to you can select that it'll run the script it'll open them all up one at a time and push that information into it very quickly so for example let's just select those ones we'll put those under other click type click and go it's not like in that shared parameter file somebody must have removed it but as you can see you can kind of go down and quickly quickly fill those in so again it's a tool that bim store use on a daily basis um you know it allows us to do very quickly so if you do want us to put you in contact or you want to go and have a look at it a little bit further um obviously the website is rtvtools.com Uh, in the future, uh, look out for the plugin that Space Group are actually providing, uh, which is a content management system uh, called the Phenim. Um, we've been working with Space Group on that a little bit, um, and that'll allow you to have the majority of your your own library and BIM store content uh, plug directly into Autodesk Revit. So, um, I hope this afternoon has been useful um you know and that you know whatever level you're at you've picked up something that you know you might take away and use in your day to day um if you would like any copies of the slides or you've got any questions for us or anything like that you know suggestions for future webinar sessions or something that you might want us to to talk through in particular uh the email address is info at bimstore.co.uk um so thank you for listening and thanks for using bimstore Thanks.